Well, we are in hour four of our Learn the Bible in 24 Hours, and we're, we're going to try to summarize the rest of the book of Genesis in this hour. And uh, so we're going to take uh, chapters 12 through 50, and we're going to read it very fast. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, seriously, unlike our usual style where we literally go through it verse by verse. And I might mention, by the way, we have a commentary on the book of Genesis in which we take 24 one-hour sessions on the entire book of Genesis, which does it far more justice. We're obviously going through just to give you a flavor and an overview of it. But uh, uh, we are going to cover uh, Abraham from chapters 12 through 20, and verses, uh, chapters 21 through 26, Isaac. 27 to 36, Jacob, and 37 to 50, Joseph. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph being considered collectively the patriarchs. And uh, so this will constitute our four. And again, of course, we're going now from Abraham uh, up to the Exodus. The book of Genesis will close with a coffin in Egypt. And the book of Exodus will pick up from there on. So we're going to cover a lot of ground here. And obviously, we just hit some highlights. Abraham, of course, is a key figure uh, to the Jews and the Christians. Uh, it's mentioned 74 times in the New Testament. And uh, he is venerated by all three monotheistic religions, Judaism and Christianity, and in a certain sense, Islam. And uh, he has some distinctive titles in the Scripture. He is known as the Father of the Faithful. There is a sense in which anyone that is faithful to God is, in a sense, a son of Abraham. Uh, not necessarily just you know, someone that's Jewish would consider himself a son of Abraham, obviously. But also anyone that's faithful can claim that title from Hebrews 11, 8 and elsewhere. Abraham also had another title. He's known as the friend of God. A friend of God. That comes from James's epistle in chapter 2, which happens to be the epistle of Yaakov, by the way, but we don't think of it that way in the English, do we? But Abraham is the beneficiary of a commitment by God that's everlasting, it's eternal, and it's unconditional. And it's very important for you to understand the, the fact that it's unconditional because that, this covenant with Abraham is what is being challenged in the world today in the struggle over Jerusalem and the land of Israel. The world, not just the PLO, the European Union, the UN, whatever, are attacking this premise of the Abrahamic covenant. Also, Abraham represents a struggle between the flesh and the spirit. And we'll talk about that as we go. That's in his, Abraham's personal life. It's also embodied in his two sons, Ishmael, the son of the flesh, and Isaac, regarded as the son of the spirit. It's also uh, emblematic between Sarah, his wife, and Hagar, her handmaid, Galatians 4 deliberately makes that parallel in a broader metaphorical sense. We're also, Abraham is going to encounter a very strange character by the name of Melchizedek, who is a subject of many misconceptions, but a very interesting person. Because Melchizedek is unique in the Scripture as being a king and a priest. One of the things that's going to get emphasized from Moses on is that Ju the tribe of Judah is the royal line, the tribe of Levi the priestly line, and they are separate. The separation of the Levitical priesthood and the, the uh, line of David and so forth are distinctive. There are only three people that are kings and priests together in one person. Melchizedek was the first that we see in the Scripture. Jesus Christ is distinctive in that he's a king and a priest. And that's what the writer to Hebrews emphasizes. And the third person is the body of Christ. The church is promised to be kings and priests, as, a, as exemplified by the 24 elders in Revelation and elsewhere. We're also going to talk about, one. There's, even though we're going pretty quickly here, we are going to pause and take a serious look at Genesis 22 because it's so pivotal. The Akedah, as it's called in Hebrew, where Abraham offers his son Isaac. A very widely misunderstood passage. Abraham's father is Terah. Terah had Abraham, Nahor, Haran, and a, uh, through, another, through another wife, had a daughter by the name of Sarai. So Sarai is going to marry Abraham, but he, she is really his half-sister. They have a common father, but different mothers. 
So later on and several times, Abraham will pass her off as his sister. He's not lying, but he is deceiving. You see, so Abraham, Abraham will have two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael will be the son of, of Abraham with Sarah's handmaid and uh, Isaac, his son, directly. Uh, Nahor will have a number of uh, children that won't concern us directly. But uh, Haran has a, a series of sons, one of which is Lot. So Lot is a nephew of Abraham, and that's going to become important later on. And uh, under Nahor, we have Bethuel, who has uh, Rebekah and Laban. And Rebekah will be, become important because she will end up becoming the wife of Isaac. And so these things are interlaced, if you will. And of course, uh, from that union, we have Esau and Jacob. And we'll talk about that in great length. Under Laban, of course, he has two daughters, Leah and Rachel. And they're the ones that will marry Jacob. And they, along with their hand, two handmaids, those four women will raise the twelve tribes that make up the nation Israel. So that's the family. That's the family tree. So the twelve tribes will come from that issue. And uh, over on the other side, Lot will have, um, by incest with his daughters, inadvertently while he's drunk, they take him and they will, their offspring will be Moab and Ammon. The Moabites and Ammonites have a pretty dismal heritage. But I want to dwell a little bit on Genesis 12. The Lord would say to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Verses 2 and 3 of chapter 12 are precious, precious verses. This whole passage is, of course, called, regarded as the call of Abraham. Get thee out of thy country, and so forth. But then God makes a commitment to him. I'll make thee a great nation. I'll bless thee, and make thy name great, and shall be a blessing. Notice verse 3. Because I think this is the only reason God has not judged America. As I travel, one of the most common questions I get from audiences that are knowledgeable is, why hasn't God judged America? We've become the exporter of everything God abhors, the sin in this country, the abandonment of our heritage, etc., etc. You make a long list of things. Why hasn't God judged? In fact, Billy Graham summarized it so eloquently years ago. He said, if God doesn't judge America, you'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And very good, you know, that's a great soundbite. But why hasn't he? You know, Thomas Jefferson said, I tremble for my country when I recall that God is just and that his justice will not sleep forever. Why hasn't God judged America? And many of us believe it's because of verse 3 of chapter 12. God has promised Abraham, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee, and these shall all the families of the earth be blessed. We suspect that the reason God hasn't judged America is because of our support for His people Israel. That doesn't mean we have to agree with their policies, no. But we do provide for their protection. And that, I think, is God-honoring. And uh, uh, people say, Chuck, aren't you worried about Israel? No, I'm not worried about Israel, because I know that he that keepeth Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Amen. But uh, they have some tough times ahead. But their, their, their history, the beginning, ups and downs and end, all laid out in advance. It's in the Bible. I worry about America because it's not in the Bible. And despite what some people like to say, I think I worry about America because our only hope in this country is for a revival, that we might get our act together. But that's a whole other thing we'll get to sometime. There are seven I wills in this commitment of God to Abraham. So I'll make of thee a great nation. And indeed he did. I will bless thee. And indeed he does. I will make thy name great. And indeed there's no great name on the planet earth greater than Abraham's. Thou shalt be a blessing. And indeed he is. I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families, not just the Jews, all families of the earth be blessed. Keep key verse. There are three major promises in the Bible. This is the first of the three. The covenant with Abraham. In his seed, all nations will be blessed. Key thing. God's covenant with the nation Israel. Now this had some conditions to it. If they faithfully served him, they'd prosper. If they forsake him, they would be destroyed. And indeed they were. On again, off again, again and again and again. Their whole history is a profile of that commitment. But the third covenant was God's covenant with David. That his family would produce the Messiah who would reign over God's people forever. And that's another commitment that God gave to uh, uh, these three, three basic promises. In Genesis 14, we encounter the battle of nine kings. A strange story. There are four Shemite kings, 
Amraphel, Arioch, Shadar, Lamer, and uh, Tidal, King of Nations. And uh, these four are, will have a war with the uh, five Ham, uh, Hamite uh, nations. Um, Bera, the king of Sodom, Bersha, the king of Gomorrah, Shineb, the king of Adma, uh, Zemeb, the king of Zeboim, and king of Bela. So these, um, the, the, the Hamites served the Shemites for 12 years. But then the third year, thirteenth year, they rebelled, and uh, Shardalamer, the one on the left, this group. And by the way, it's interesting. You'll notice the list there. Small point, but I'd like you to learn from this. The key guy is Shardalamer, but he's listed third. He's the power guy, of course, of the whole bunch. It turns out. But it's interesting. The one that's named first is Amraphel, the king of Shinar, which is Babylon. Later, it's mentioned first, I believe, because the Bible tends to list things with an order that's editorially significant, that's the king that's going to be important downstream. But in any case, uh, Shadalamar defeats the Hamites and takes them all captive. But among them was Lot, Abraham's nephew. He was, a, he, he was in Sodom as an el alderman, and we'll discover him uh, very active <laughs> in uh, chapter 19, a few chapters from now. But... Uh, Anyway, taking Lot was a big mistake, because Abraham finds out that his nephew's been taken. Understand that these four kings wiped out these five kings. This, this was not a trivial um, military operation. But Abraham, with his own people, will rescue Lot and take spoil of these four kings. Abraham, this text tells us, had 318 trained soldiers in his own household. Abraham may have been one of the wealthiest people on the planet Earth at that time. We don't, he's not some kind of tribal leader. He's, he, is a, he is a powerful personage at this time. So we have the slaughter of the kings. Abraham's army rescues Lot and the people of Sodom. When he does this, he comes back to a place called Salem that will later become Jerusalem. And there we encounter this strange character called Melchizedek, which is a title rather than a name, King of Righteousness. He's the king and priest of this place called Salem. He receives Abram's tithes. For reasons we have no insight into, Abram is, uh, 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 presents tithes of his victory to Melchizedek. And uh, this, would pro this is just a couple of verses in chapter 14 of Genesis. It would disappear into obscurity except for the fact that it is, re it is leaned upon in Psalm 110 and in three chapters of the book of Hebrews. Make a big thing of this character of Melchizedek. Making a contrast between Melchizedek and the priesthood that we all know from Moses and Le Levi and all of that that comes later. So this guy is distinctive. He's a king and a priest. He's the king of the Most High God. And uh, he does a strange thing. He administers to Abraham bread and wine. And this bread and wine theme goes all the way through the Scripture. The bread and wine with Melchizedek offering it to him. The bread and wine that are prominent in the dreams of Joseph in Egypt later. And, of course, the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper, etc. There is a theme there that all ties together consistently. Now... So some people try to make Melchizedek an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. I don't think so. The, the, the writer of the Hebrews makes the point that Melchizedek had no beginning and end of days, simply meaning it wasn't recorded to make a rhetorical point. And many people misunderstand that. We know Melchizedek was a man, because it says so. Um, uh, and, and anyway, many of these theories are, are on, on frail ground. But he is used as an example for a lot of points later on in the Scripture. But in Genesis 15, the next chapter, we have a very critical chapter to understand. There is an unusual ritual used in those days when one wanted to make a very sacred covenant between themselves. They would set up an they'd make up an offering, split it in two parts, and the two signatories to the to the agreement would walk together in a figure eight between these parts. They would divide. Uh, they would cut a covenant, is the term. That's where the term means barat. And they would divide an offer in two parts, and then they would march in a figure eight between them, repeating the terms of their agreement. That was the way they did things in those days. Well, God indulges 
in a rather strange version of this ritual. He has Abraham set it all up for him, set up the thing. But before, before he can begin, he puts Abraham in a deep sleep and God goes it alone in the form of a flame through this thing. The point God is making is that this is a sacred covenant, but it is unconditional. Abraham could add nothing to it. There's no way he could violate it. He's not a party to it except as a beneficiary. God is doing it on his own. It deals with the commitment of the land to his descendants from the river Egypt to the great river Euphrates. And when somebody wants to talk about the West Bank, say, what river did you have in mind? Because the Jordan isn't the eastern border. Ultimately, it'll be, of course, the river Euphrates. And it's very, very strange that there are four angels bound in the river Euphrates that will be released in the book of Revelation. So it's strange that some of these demonic or these uh, spiritual things have territorial aspects to them. God tells them that you're going to be, your, your descendants will be afflicted in Egypt for 400 years. That's what Acts tells us also. Exodus 12, we know they were in there 430 years. Gee, is there a discrepancy? No, they were afflicted for 400 of the 430. They were there for a while with the Pharaoh that knew Joseph, etc. Anyway, but they'll be afflicted in 400 years, but they will return to the land. When God tells that to Abraham, Satan's listening, and he knows now he has four centuries to lay down a minefield. And they'll return with great possession. But, Abraham, the, but then Satan will have had laid more Nephilim there to, to, to... And by the way, when Moses later will send the twelve spies into the land, ten of them come back saying, they're Nephilim in the land. Same word used in Numbers 13, 33. So the terms of covenant, they were declared eternal and unconditional, despite what the PLO and the UN may think. It was reconfirmed by an oath in Genesis 22. It was confirmed to Isaac and to Jacob in Genesis 26. This commitment to Abraham is confirmed to Isaac and then to Jacob in Genesis 26. And by the way, the conditions under which it was confirmed to Isaac and Jacob were conditions of disobedience. It's not as if their obedience was a prerequisite to this, this uh, covenant. It's unilateral. So despite their acts of disobedience, it's confirmed to Isaac and Jacob. And that's what Islam is also a challenge to, by the way. New Testament declares this covenant as immutable, unchangeable, Hebrews 6 and elsewhere. Well, Abraham becomes Abraham in Genesis 17. God changes his name to Abraham, and I'll talk about that in a minute. He confirmed his covenant to the father of many nations. He instituted circumcision as a sign. This is where circumcision is instituted as a sign. He not only changes Abraham's name to Abraham, he changed Sarai's name to Sarah. And he also promised him a son, a son of his own, not Ishmael, a son of his own. So we have a commitment of land to his descendants, as I mentioned, and uh, they'll return with a great possession. Uh, before we get into this, I'd like to give you a little bit of lesson in Hebrew. You might find this interesting. You know, most alphabets are phonetic. If you know how it's pronounced, you can pronounce the words. If you know the alphabet, be it Russian or Latin or whatever. Hebrew is a little strange. It's not only phonetic, it is conceptual. Each letter has not only a sound, it has a meaning. Let's take a couple of examples to show you what I mean. The first letter in the Hebrew alphabet is an aleph. On the screen there on the right, you see the way it's written today. The way you see Hebrew written today is the way it was written after the Babylon, when they returned from the Babylonian captivity. The way it was written before Babylon was a little different. The aleph was written sort of to represent like a longhorn oxen head. Aleph was the first letter of the alphabet. It also represented strength, like an ox, you see. The, the, the University of Arizona's Hebrew department has discovered if they, show, if they teach the kids how Hebrew is written before Babylon, they can learn the meaning of the letters. If you, go, if you can know the meaning of the letters, you can read about 80% of Hebrew. It's astonishing. Uh, the, the, so Aleph means the first or strength or leader, okay? That's easy. That's understandable. The second letter is bet. It looks like a little teepee. It, bet, it represents a house. That's not the way it's written today. It's got a different shorthand, but the original way it looked like a little teepee. That bet turns to become our B, if you will. If you can visualize it turning 90 degrees, it becomes our B. But it's a bet in Hebrew. The word bet means house or family. Bethlehem, house of bread. Bethel, house of God, you see. And Bethlehem, Bel, and so forth. If you take... And Aleph, and bear in mind, all letters flow, all languages flow towards Jerusalem. Do you know that? Hebrew, Aramaic, 
uh, uh, Arabic, Sanskrit, all go from right to left. All nations west of Jerusalem go from left to right. Latin, English, French, uh, uh, Russian, uh, da da da, etc. Okay? So understand that the Aleph and the Beth make up a word, Ab. Well, the Aleph, of course, is a, a leader or strength. Bet is the house. The leader, A-B, Ab, is the leader of the house. That's their name for what? Father. Ab is the name of father. Abba is the, is the familiar yeah. form of it. There's another letter called a He, which is a breath. Remember in Pygmalion, uh, Henry Higgins teaches Liza Doolittle to pronounce her in Hartford, Hereford, Hampshire, hurricanes hardly happen. You get her to, 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 to pronounce her H's. H is just a breath. In the Hebrew, that breath can mean wind or it can mean spirit. But the He, if you put a He, which is probably originally meant it was like a hand lifted up or like an open window, but whatever, um, it means behold or revealed or a breath or wind, breeze, wind or spirit. Um, if you take a word and put a he in the middle of it, you're, you're speaking to the essence of that word. And if you put a, a he between an aleph and a bet, you have ahab, the essence of the Father. That's the word for love. In other words, the word for love is the essence of the Father. The point I'm trying to make here, in the Hebrew alphabet, they convey not just sound, but conceptual meaning. It's a very different kind of a language. Um, so... So when you take Abraham and Sarai, God simply puts a he in the middle of the name. Abraham, Sarah. He gives them, the, he inserts the Spirit of God in both of them. Circumcision is to the sign. You know, it's kind of interesting if you study circumcision medically. There's, it require, there's a vitamin K, which is an element required for blood clotting. It's not formed until the fifth day uh, and through to the seventh day. There's also a material called prothrobin, which is also necessary for blood clotting. On the third day of an infant, it's only about 30% of normal. On the eighth day, it's 110% of normal. Then it levels off at 100% of normal. So if you plot these curves on a chart, the optimum time, if you're going to circumcise a child, is on the eighth day. We know that now medically. If you do it too early or too late, you run the risk of having a, you know, a continuing hemorrhage. The question I ask you is, how did Moses know that? Did he do it by trial and error? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> okay, so this raises something else I have to share with you. You know, they, the, the book of Acts tells us that Moses was trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Before he fled from, from Pharaoh and all that, he was trained as the prince of Egypt. He was trained in all their schools. We have copies of the medical records of that time in 1332 B.C. It's called Papyrus Ebers. And let me tell you some of the things that he must have been taught. It, do you have an embedded splinter? You know what you do for an embedded splinter? You apply worm's blood and ass's dung. That's the way you take care of splinters. Try that sometime. Um, are you losing your hair? You apply six fats, the fats of a horse, a hippopotamus, a crocodile, a cat, a snake, and an ibex. That will take care of your losing hair, guys. Just thought I'd mention that. You're turning gray, anoint with the blood of a black calf which has been boiled in oil or uh, fat of a rattlesnake. That'll work, huh? Great. Here's what a well-stocked medicine cabinet would have in the days of Egypt. Lizard's blood, swine's teeth, putrid meat, moisture from pig's ears, milk goose grease, asses' hooves, animal fats, Excrement from animals of human, donkeys, antelopes, dogs, cats, and flies. That's what you would stock your medicine. Does it sound kind of weird to you? It better. <laughs> what's astonishing, what's astonishing is these quaint, bizarre beliefs of the Egyptian culture that was inculcated in the leadership never finds its way into Moses' writings. What's interesting is not only what's in the Bible, what's interesting is what's not in the Bible. You will find none of these superstitions, none of these weird things. In fact, those things which look weird in the Bible at first, when we investigate, turn out to be discoveries of, of, of significant kinds. Well, let's get on to Abram in chapter 18. Abraham gets, he's by the Oaks of Mamre, and he gets three visitors. This is a very famous incident, so we, we obviously can't get all the incidents in his life because there's much there, but... 
these three visitors show up, and they're interesting characters because, first of all, Abraham hurries to them and then hurried back to the tent. He ran to the herd to make dinner and had his servant hurried. You can tell that Abraham realizes who these three people are. You know who they are? God and two angels posing as men. They look like men. Abraham bowed low before them. He got water to wash their feet. He served them freshly baked bread, a choice calf, curds and milk. And if you have a Jewish friend, ask him how on earth did he serve a non-kosher meal? But I'll leave that one alone. I'll just throw that out there so you can indulge in some mischief with your Jewish friends. He also stood while they were eating. What on earth is going on here? And obviously these three men are, are, are the Lord and two angels. And he gives them three measures of meal, which from that day on in the Jewish and Arabic cultures is the fellowship offering. And that, you need to understand that when you get to Matthew 18 to understand what the three measures of meal are dealing with there. It'll surprise you. But uh, these three visitors confirm to Abraham and Sarai that a son from Sarah will be con was confirmed. She's going to be a hundred years old. And she laughs when she hears this. Am I in my old age going to have pleasure, she says? You laugh. Oh, I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh. Yes, you did. They said. Anyway, a little dialogue. But the funny part about this is God says, is Abraham not my friend? Should I not tell him what I'm going to do? So what he does there in Genesis 18, he explains to God that these two, his two angels are going to go down and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. For the rest of that chapter, you almost have to imagine a New York Jewish accent as you read the text. Because Abraham decides to negotiate with God, okay? Will not the God of the universe do right? What if there's 50 righteous in the land? Will you, would you spare, would you wipe the land for the, he says, if there's 50 righteous, I'll spare the land. 50. God says, no, then I won't do it. Well, what if there's five short of 50? What if there's 45? God says, if there's 45 righteous, I won't do it. Abraham says, well, what if, there's 40. If there's 40, I won't do it. Abraham, you know, he has what we call, uh, what the Jews call chutzpah, okay? Chutzpah is a strange, untranslatable word. Uh, it, it, there are many stories that try to demonstrate what chutzpah is. Chutzpah is when a guy murders his mother and father, then throws himself on the mercy of the court because he's an orphan. See? That's chutzpah, see? Uh, he goes to God and he says, what if there's 30 righteous? If there's 30, I won't do it. God says, well, let me, would you believe 20? God says, if there's 20, I won't do it. And then Abraham says, he knows he's pushing his luck here. He's, he's pretty, I'll do it just one more time. I'll just say this one more time. Suppose there's 10 righteous. Will you spare the city? And he says, if there's 10 righteous, I won't do it. And, and Abraham breaks off, right? But when chapter 19 comes and the two angels go down there to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah, something very strange to notice in the text. The angels are down there to get Lot out of town first. But what's interesting, if you read the text carefully, it wasn't optional. The angels point out to Lot they can't do their job until Lot is out of there. What this implies is that if Abraham had said, suppose there's one righteous, God would spare it for the one. And I mention this because I believe this pulls the rug out from under those that like to theorize about a partial rapture and so forth. Um, but we'll, go, we'll move on. Sodom, chapter 19, of course, these two angels visit Lot. The homosexuals seek the visitors. And it's interesting that the entire town is at the door trying to abuse these two visitors that, uh, that uh, Lot has. Lot even offers the crowd, this mob that are out to... Uh, abuse these visitors. He offers them his virgin daughters rather than let his guests be violated. That shocks us. I mean, we can't... It's astonishing. It does indicate that Lot recognized he had something on his hands other than just two visitors. The angel, of course, blind the attackers so they can't even find the door. Lot's family is evacuated. But if you read the text carefully, it's a prerequisite condition to the judgment that Lot be out of there. 
And it's, the reason I emphasize this is Jesus Himself likened His return to those days. So you need to do a little homework and understand that. You won't understand Luke 17 unless you really understand Genesis 19. And of course, all the way through there, we have the, the theme being hit, the flesh versus spirit. Uh, Abraham was 430 years before the law. So promises of God preceded the law. So the law cannot disannul his promises. And that's an argument Paul makes in Galatians. Because don't assume that the law is required for those benefits because the benefits were committed before the law was even uh, ordained. Ishmael versus Isaac is contrasted also. The two son, the sons of two principles, the flesh and the spirit. Ishmael, the son of the flesh, Isaac, the son of the spirit. Ishmael, the flesh, and also of unbelief. And uh, the son of the bondwoman will not be heir, Paul declares. And Isaac, of course, is the son of the promise in response to the faith. And the ultimate triumph of faith is the offering of Isaac, which we're going to get to in a minute here. In fact, let's just jump in and get Genesis 22. This, this is one of those chapters that we're going to pause and take a little more carefully because it's too pivotal and too widely misunderstood. God tells Abraham to offer his son Isaac on a mountain. God is ordaining child sacrifice? You've got to be kidding. That's not what it's about at all. People who think so just have, are, 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 are just uninformed. The Bible tells us in Hosea 12, verse 10, God says, I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions, and used similitudes by ministry of the prophets. God indulges in what you and I would call figures of speech or metaphors, and there are many different kinds. There's a thing called a simile. There's a thing called an allegory. There's a thing called a metaphor. They're hypocatastasis, a type, an analogy. These are figures of speech. Do you know how many different kinds of figures of speech are in the Bible? Over 200 different kinds of figures of speech. And they are cataloged for you in our book. We have a book called Cosmic Codes, and one of the appendices is a list of these two, several hundred of these. Describe, defines what they are and gives you examples in verses where they are used. There are figures of speech in the Bible. That's why I don't, I don't law, say anymore to people who are saying, you take the Bible literally. I do take the Bible literally, but when I say that, they don't know what I'm talking about. When you take the Bible literally, then you think God has feathers because of Psalm 91. Under his feathers, I shall... No, that's a figure of speech, obviously. So fi taking it literally doesn't deny the rhetorical device of figures of speech. What I usually, what I've learned to say when I'm on a radio interview or something, we take the Bible seriously. And when that gets the other guy mad, I know I've struck gold. Because he doesn't want to admit he doesn't take it as seriously as we do, but we take it more literally than he does. So anyway, so, so there are figures of speech. One of these figures of speech is what's called in scholarship a type. You and I would use the term in our vocabulary as a model. If you build a house of complicated vertical uh, aspects, you'll make a three-dimensional model of it. If, you have an, if you're designing an airplane wing, you'll make a mathematical model of the airplane wing to see how it's going to behave under buffeting and so forth. We make models of things, sometimes mathematical, sometimes physical, whatever. Those are models. Well, we're, what we, a model in the Scripture, we use the term type. It's a, a figure, an example of something in the future. We're going to look at the classic model in the Bible called Genesis 22. It has a Hebrew name called the Akedah. He says, It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, he said, here, Behold, here am I. He said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now this is pretty interesting. He said, Notice he says, Thine only son Isaac. See, Ishmael is not an issue. He's the son of the flesh, not the spirit. So from, as far as God's concerned, he has one son, the son of the promise, the son of, uh, the, the son Isaac. There's another principle in the Scripture you want to be sensitive to. It's called by the scholars the law of first mention. When a thing is mentioned the first time in the Bible, it usually is profoundly significant. It's usually definitive for some reason. You'll notice here in this passage, Take now thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. This is the place in the Bible that the word love first appears. And it's significant because what this should echo to you, because we have a father and a son he loves. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
that whosoever believes in should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 should echo, in effect, from this verse, as you'll see before we're finished. And get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. By the time you get to Genesis 22, Abraham has really learned his lessons. He's had a lot of uh, fallbacks. He's had a lot of lapses, a lot of problems. He's learned from these. When you get to Genesis 22, God says, Offer your son. The next morning, he takes off to do it. He doesn't mess around. Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, and took, notice, he took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. So there's four guys Abraham, Isaac, two young men, and their donkey. Clave the wood, the burnt offering, rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. He just takes off early next morning. No messing around. Gee, I'll pray about it. No, no. He obeys. And they go from Beersheba, which is a three-day journey south of Jerusalem, to that region. Jerusalem isn't there. It, Salem is. But Melchizedek and all that. We saw a few chapters earlier. But I put Jerusalem on the map so you'll recognize the geography here. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar so off. In the New Testament, we'll learn that as far as Abraham's concerned, Isaac was dead to Abraham when the commandment came. When God says, offer your son, as far as Abraham's concerned, he's, he's good as dead. On the third day after the trip, Isaac will be returned to Abraham. So how long was, Abraham, uh, was Isaac gone? Three days. That's prophetic of the three days in the tomb, by the way. We'll go on here. Abraham said unto his young man, Abide ye here with the ass. I and the land will go yonder, worship, and come again to you. I want you to notice that phrase. These two guys that have come, you stay here at the bottom of the hill. He's about 600 meters above sea level. He's going to go up this ridge system called Mount Moriah. Yep, it's going to go up about 177 meters um, to offer Isaac. But he says, we're going to come in. He's going to come in. Abraham believed that Isaac would be resurrected. See, he's got, he's got an interesting mindset here. God wants Abraham to offer Isaac. Abraham's point of view is God's got a problem. I don't have a problem. God promised me that Isaac's going to have children. So if God wants me to offer Isaac, God's going to have to raise him from the dead because God's promised me. He's going to, I know God's going to keep his promises. Do you understand the faith here? Do you understand? It's not just that he, he, faith, not just that he did what God said. That's part of it, of course. But he also understood that God keeps his promises. God finds a different way every day to ask each of us, do you trust me? Different ways. That's what he's doing here. Abraham took the young wood of the burnt offering, laid upon Isaac his son, and took fire in his hand and the knife, and they went, both of them, in agreement. It says together in the, both of them together in the English. Hebrew implies they went in agreement. By the way, don't be victims of your Sunday school coloring books. There is reason to believe that Isaac was probably 30 years old here. He wasn't some kid that doesn't know what's going on. Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. He said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac ain't going up the hill, and he knows there's going to be an offering. Well, what's going on here, Dad? Uh, where is the lamb? And when I get to verse uh, 8, I always used to think this was just a stall. You know, Abraham said, Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So they both went of them together. I first read that, well, you know, he hasn't told the kid what's really up here, you know? No. Notice what Abraham said to Isaac. My son, God will provide who? Himself a lamb for the burnt offering. I believe Abraham knew he was acting out prophecy. And I prove that to you before we're through the next few verses here. Provide himself a lamb. They came to the place where God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. He's ready to do the deed. And, of course, an angel stops him at the last minute. Now, where are they? Mount Moriah is a ridge system between two valleys. A valley of the Teropian Valley to the west, on the other side of which is Mount Zion, technically. Mount Zion is used connotatively for the whole region, of course. Um, and uh, the Kidron Valley, which separates Mount, uh, the Mount Moriah from Mount of Olives. So you've got a ridge, Mount of Olives to the east, Mount Zion to the west, and you've got this ridge between the two. Of course, along the south, you have the, the uh, Hinnom Valley. And at the bottom is a place called Salem, or Ophel, the city of David. It was a town back then, because Melchizedek was a king and priest there. 
I don't think that Abraham offered Isaac in town. I think he went north to the peak. As you go north from, from about 600 meters above, this is a topographic map, when you go from 600 meters above sea level to about the 741 meters sea level, there's a saddleback. That, is, that will later become the thrashing floor of Aruna that David will buy for, to, uh, in order to have a site for the temple. But they don't stop there. That's still not the peak. You keep going further north, you get to about 777 meters above sea level, and you get to a place that's called Golgotha. Now, Abraham may not have realized the detail to which he was enacting this, but 2,000 years later, on that very spot, another father will offer his son as an offering for sin. You and I are beneficiaries of a love letter that was written in blood, written on a wooden cross, erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. Of course, the angel stops as uh, Abraham, Abraham. The angel Lord called him and said, Abraham, Abraham. You know, see, girls, you always have to tell men twice. That's, that's scriptural. Eli, Eli, Abraham, Abraham. Yeah. He said, here am I. He said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Paul in Romans 8 makes capital of this. He says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Speaking, of course, none other than Jesus Christ. It's interesting in Leviticus, when it talks about the key offerings here, it says, He shall kill it on the side of the altar northward before the Lord and the priests, and Aaron's son shall sprinkle his blood round upon the altar. Notice that northward. It's north of the camp, north of the city that this takes place. And that's where uh, Golgotha is, of course, relative to Jerusalem. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, there was a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. Abraham went and took the ram, offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Substitutionary ram. That would be codified in the law of Moses later. Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, or Ye Yahweh Jireh. But anyway, it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. That's the name that Abraham gives this spot. That name is prophetic. In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. He realizes that this is prophetic, at least in some, how much he, he knew is, is hard to second guess, but clearly uh, uh, it uh, is real. And the book of Hebrews capitalizes on this. In Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead. And once also he received him in a figure, in a figure or in a type. See, it was Abraham's belief in the resurrection of Isaac that caused him to be saved. It's our belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we're saved. That's what the gospel is all about. Paul defines the gospel in 1 Corinthians 4, 15, first four verses. Get to the book of Revelation. It's all echoed again. Book of Revelation. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the th throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven or on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book and neither look thereon. And John says, I sobbed convulsively because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Wow. We don't understand what's going on, but John did. He wept, sobbed, wept much or sobbed convulsively. And one of the elders said to me, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood not, 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 a, not a lion, stood the Lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth in all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, and we have the closing of the biggest escrow in the universe where Jesus Christ takes possession of that which He purchased with His blood on a cross 2,000 years ago. Back to Genesis 22. And the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time, said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Then we get to verse 19. I want you to make a notice in your Bible. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up 
and went together to Beersheba. And Abram dwelt in Beersheba. Remember that verse. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Two chapters later, next chapter, in chapter 23, Sarah dies. There's a whole business there. Then in Genesis 24, Abraham has another errand that he wants his business partner to, to do. He commissions Eliezer to gather a bride for Isaac, to go back to their home country and get a bride for Isaac. And Eliezer agrees to do this. He quali- By the way, Eliezer is, yes, he's a servant, but he's actually his business partner. If Abraham had died without issue, Eliezer would have inherited his estate. Eliezer qualifies her by a well. She agrees to marry the bridegroom she has never met. On the way back, he gives her gifts. And he finally comes, when he gets back home to, our, to, to where we are, back to Beersheba, he joins her bi- bridegroom at the well of Lahai Roy. What's going on here? Understand that Rebecca is picked by this eldest servant to be the bride of Isaac. Okay. And uh, now, Abraham is in the role of what? The father. Remember Genesis 22? Abraham was the role of the father. Isaac was in the role of the son. Offered, right? Here again, Abraham is the role of the father. Isaac again is the son, or in this case, the bridegroom. Okay? Eliezer is in the role of the Holy Spirit, sent to gather a bride for the son. And by the way, the word Eliezer, do you know what it means in Hebrew? The comforter. Yeah, isn't that fun? I want to come back now to Genesis 22, verse 19. Remember, they're up there on the hill. They've done the deed. They're ready to go home. Verse 19 says, Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. They're up on the hill. Abraham and Isaac go up on the hill. They have the deal up there. Angel intervenes. Great. Abraham comes down the hill to these two young men they've left at the bottom of the hill, right? And they rose up and went together to Beersheba. Who's going home according to this verse? Abraham and two young men. Right? Understand? When we read this, we take for granted, and I'm sure it's true, that Isaac was there too. Right? But I want you to notice the Holy Spirit editing this text a little bit. Where's Isaac? Where's Isaac? The person of Isaac is personally edited out of the record. From the time that he's offered until he is united with his bride at the well of living water, two chapters later. The well of the high roy is the well of the living one who sees me, is what it technically says. I think this is fascinating because I see the Holy Spirit diddling with the text in such a way it doesn't destroy the meaning of the text. As we read it, we understand that Abraham and Isaac came down. The, the four guys took their donkey and went home. That's not what it says. Isaac is, re- the, re- the reference to him is removed because by doing so it fits the type. It fits the type. There are many places in the scripture where the, the, the narrative, what actually happened, is adjusted just a little bit to fit a larger purpose that God has in communicating with us. One integrated design. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. Augustine first noticed that. Well, the descendants of Abraham, we talk about Sarah, Haggai, and Keturah. Sarah had, of course, Isaac. Hagar had Ishmael. Keturah had a whole bunch of characters that become the sons of Keturah. And we have the, what are generally called the Arabs. Uh, Median, Midian, and, and the rest of these guys. The uh, Jokshan descendants become the Saudi Arabians, if you will. The sons of Midian were the Bedouins, pretty much. And uh, so we'll go on here. Uh, under Ishmael, they had 12 princes under Ishmael. And uh, when Isaac marries Rebekah, they have two sons, Esau and Jacob. Jacob will be the son of the, the spirit, Esau the son of the flesh. Let's talk about Jacob a little bit. Yaakov means God protect. Uh, Akev means heal. The word really means uh, it's very close to Akob, the deceitful or sly or insidious one. So there's a pun involved here. So you can, you can uh, translate the word Yaakov or Jacob as the one who grabs the heel, which is what he did when he was born. He grabbed the heel of his older brother. And, uh, or one who trips up. Jacob will be a heel catcher. He's going to be the conniver. He's going to be the con artist. Uh, if God can justify Jacob, he can justify any of us. Um, in Romans chapter 9, Paul points out that for the children being not yet born, referring to these two kids, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, 
but of him that called. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, and as written, Jacob I have loved, and Esau have I hated. And God sees this coming because Esau will have disdain for his birthright. Jacob will covet it. So it's interesting that Esau, after being rejected by all this, will marry the Ishmaelites. So the descendants of Ishmael and Esau and also the descendants of Keturah will commingle. And they commingle to become what we generically call Arabs today. The word Arabs is unfortunately a misnomer. It's not a geographic term, or can be, but it's generally a, 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 a ethnic term. It's interesting, there is no Arab today that can trace his lineage back to Ishmael. Uh, he, he can't tra- because none of these tribes maintain distinctiveness. They crossed, married, intermarried. So whether it's Esau or Ishmael, you're dealing with then the enemies of the people of God, the enemies of Isaac and Jacob and their descendants, and have been throughout history. So when we're dealing with tensions in the Middle East, you're dealing with things that are several thousand years old, enmities that began between Esau and Jacob, in fact, maybe even earlier with Ishmael and the rest. So, the Lord said, Two nations are in thy womb, two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. Esau was the firstborn, and uh, Jacob purchased his birthright from Esau, he comes back from a hunting trip, and he's very famished, so he agrees, to, he didn't care for his birthright, so he sold it to Jacob. And then there's the formal endorsement of that, in effect, by the father that Jacob obtains by deceit. And Jacob's going to learn a lesson about deceit uh, before it's all over, too, because his sons are going to deceive him about the death of Joseph and so forth. There are many ways to study your Bible, as you can probably gather already. Obviously, you can go archaeological or historically, what actually happened from history or from archaeological finds, and that's one way, that's one level of understanding. You can look at the theological or doctrinal issues. What does this tell us about our relationship with God and His, His, His requirements? There's also comparative studies. You can compare verses with, with you know, Old, Nest, Old New Testaments, and you'll, that'll always be beneficial. And then there's a whole other form of study that you might call devotional, very personal, where you just bathe in the Word of God itself and see what God speaks to you about it. And those all intermarry with each other. There's, they're, they're not distinctive. The devotional thing typically starts with observation. Who did what, where, and when. And then the, the interpretation is the why, the primary implications of what you see. And then, of course, after all that, there's an application. You have to answer the so what question. You know, how does this affect me? So that's what, in summary, all participants in this narrative were at fault. Isaac attempted to thwart God's plan by blessing Esau. Esau broke the oath he had made with Jacob. Rebecca and Jacob tried to achieve God's blessing by deception. Their victory would heap hatred and separation. Rebecca would never see Jacob again after he splits from, from that deception with her. And Jacob alone did not destroy the family. Parental preference did. And uh, so, and lots of lessons there. Parental favoritism is part of it, which tore their family apart. Spiritual insensitivity. The reliance on the senses rather than spiritual discernment. And the whole role of deception. Jacob's only hesitancy was his fear that he would be cursed instead of blessed. That's the reason he, he hesitated, not for any deeper reason. He would later learn that blessings are given by God and not gained by deceit. So there's lots of lessons here if you take the time to really wrestle. And much of this is just wrestling to the end of self. Jacob's cheated by his uncle Laban. The twelve tribes are born to the two, two brides he has plus their two handmaids. We'll get into that in a little bit. He'll return to the land. He'll wrestle. He literally will wrestle till he gets to the end of himself. When he acknowledges who he really is, he will limp for the rest of his life. Then Jacob uh, is rec- finally reconciled to Esau. There's sin in the family when Dinah is revenged. I won't get into all that here. And he returns to Bethel. And then Benjamin is born, but Rachel dies in childbirth. So Benjamin is a very special uh, child to Jacob. So we have the patriarchs. Abraham through Sarah. Uh, through Hagar has Ishmael, but through Sarah has Isaac. And then uh, through Rebekah, he has Jacob and Esau. But under Jacob, he, uh, uh, he has two wives, Rachel and Leah. Leah has Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, the first four children of Jacob and Leah. Rachel is barren, so she's upset by that. So she gets the idea, which was the practice in those days. 
she could have a substitute wife, her hand, give, give her husband her handmaid to be a, a, a proxy wife, so to speak. So Bilhah then has Dan and Naphtali. Leah sees that going on and says, that's a pretty good idea, I'll do the same thing. So she gives him her handmaid, Zilpah, through whom he has Gad and Asher. And by this time, J- Rachel finally has a child, Joseph. And because Jacob loved Rachel more than life itself, and so Joseph, her firstborn, becomes especially endeared to Jacob, and, and we'll get into all that shortly. Leah, meanwhile, has Issachar and Zebulun, and then finally Rachel has one more child, Benjamin, but in, dies, dies in that childbirth. There you have the twelve tribes. But I should mention here, probably, so you don't get confused, there are more than twelve tribes. There are actually thirteen, in a sense. Because Joseph, when he's down in Egypt, will have two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob will adopt them as his own. So if you want to have twelve tribes, you can use the twelve I just mentioned. But if you want to leave one out for some reason, for example, if you want the marching order, knowing that Levi is a priest and doesn't participate in the military, you leave Levi out, you still can get twelve tribes, because by leaving Levi out, Instead of Joseph, you have Manasseh and Ephraim. So you've got an alphabet of 13 to pick 12 from, so to speak. When you get to the book of Revelation, you want to leave the tribe of Dan out. The tribes are listed 20 times in the Bible, each time in a different order, and each time there's somebody different that's left out, but you always still have 12. For various reasons, one or the other may be left out, but you make up the difference by jockeying between Joseph, whether it's Joseph as a singular or Manasseh and Ephraim as a pair. Do you follow me? So if you have 13, you, get, you can leave one out and still have a dozen, if you will. The tribe of Dan is conspicuous in his omission several places in the Scripture, not the least of which is the book of Revelation 7, chapter 7. And Dan's left out. Ephraim isn't mentioned either, but she, it, it's inferred uh, uh, with the back of the hand, because Manasseh is mentioned, and then the tribe of Joseph is subsequently mentioned, which is obviously would be left, would be Ephraim. Dan is not mentioned. You still have the 12 tribes. So you want to watch that, because there's lessons in each one. Just be sensitive to it at this point. In succession, uh, Reuben was the firstborn. He would be the natural heir, but he was disavowed because he had illicit relationships with his father's concubine. And Simeon and Levi were uh, sort of out of the running because they, of their extremes. In, uh, at Shechem, there's an incident where they get unusually violent. That means Judah was next in line, so Judah is the royal line, and Judah is very key for the rest of the Scripture. Not always right, makes mistakes, but nevertheless, the royal line. And Joseph is the favorite as firstborn from Rachel, Jacob's favorite, and he, of course, has his adventures in Egypt, as we'll see shortly. It's interesting to notice how often God bypasses the firstborn. Seth over Cain, Shem over Japheth, Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, Judah and Joseph ahead of Reuben, Moses ahead of Aaron. Aaron was, was older than Moses. David ahead of all his brothers. So firstborn is a basic rule, but God is very sovereign to get around it when he feels like it. And it's very interesting. There's a strange chapter in chapter 38 that will be skipped by most commentators. It's sort of a sordid event that you sort of wonder, what on earth is it here for? And that's Judah's sin with Tamar. It's kind of complicated, but I'll try to simplify it. We're now going to look at the period of just before the Exodus. Judah marries a gal by the name of Shua and has three sons, a guy by the name of Er, Onan, and Shelah. For Er, there is Tamar as his wife. But Er displeases God, so God takes him out of the picture. That leaves Tamar without a husband. There is a law of Leverite marriage. What is supposed to happen if a uh, husband dies without leaving issue, it's the uh, implied obligation of a brother to raise up issue to the widow. And so Judah instructs Onan to take Tamar uh, to raise up issue. And uh, Onan declines to do that. He has sexual intercourse with her, but he spills, he, he withdraws and put, spills the seed on the ground. And that offends God, so God takes him out of the picture. So Tamar now has got that twice. Judah is looking this over, and he's not too excited about giving Shelah to Tamar. He's just lost two of his three sons. So, but, he, but he tells Tamar to, uh, in effect, set aside when Sheila's old enough, you'll have Sheila. But he doesn't, doesn't follow through on it. 
as time goes on, Tamar realizes that she's been, you know, uh, put on the back burner, so to speak. So she does a strange thing. She poses as a prostitute. Apparently, it was the, in those times the prostitute would wear a veil. She, 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 po- she both dresses and sets herself up on a hilltop as a prostitute, knowing that Judah would come by there, and entices Judah into having relations. He doesn't realize it's his daughter-in-law. You follow me? And uh, uh, he, 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 he leaves some pledges that he would pay her, he'd give her a kid from the flock. Until he can get the flock, he gives her a signet and, and a staff and, and, uh, as, a, as a pledge. And then later on, he gets, he, he gets his best buddy to take this kid back there to, give, to retrieve his, his things. By then, she's shut down, gone back home and put on her normal dress. And uh, so the guy can't find her. There's no prostitute on this hilltop anymore. There's nobody here. He goes back. Judah's puzzled by the whole thing, but doesn't know quite what to do about it. Then he finds out a few months later that Tamar is pregnant. And is he livid? She's going to be burnt. And she comes up and says, fine, uh, whose signet is this and whose staff is this? And he realizes what's happened and he blames himself, not her. Because he recognizes that the reason this happened was because he didn't keep his promise and give her Sheila as a husband. He says, my sin is greater than hers. So it's a very sordid, strange story. But the reason it's important, she has twins. Zara and Ferez. And Zara gets born first, but his hand comes out first. They put a red thing on it, and then the other one comes out first. So uh, he's a breech birth, birth in effect. But Ferez is regarded as the heir, and he is then in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Because of Judah through Tamar, Ferez is in the royal line. That's why it's here at all, Okay. Zerah, by the way, by some non-biblical sources, I understand, may have been the one that succeeded Joseph when Joseph died in Egypt and becomes the leader of the Hyksos, the shepherd kings that later migrate away before uh, all the rest of it. But anyway, but uh, the reason I'm getting into this is because uh, there's, is it, I want you to understand this concept of the Leverite marriage is very important later in the scripture comes from the word, not, not from Levitical, liver, from the Levir, a husband's brother. It's codified in the, to- the Torah in Deuteronomy 25. It also deals with the role of the Goel, the kinsman redeemer. Jesus Christ is going to play that role. We'll talk about that when we get to the book of Ruth in great depth. Where G- Jesus is our kinsman redeemer in this role. And it'll deal with the ultimate redemption, which was occurring in Revelation 5. But I want to show you something that people miss in the text of Genesis 38. You say, what is this weird story doing right in the middle of this really neat story coming with Joseph and all that? Well, it turns out that at 49 letter intervals, we have the name of Boaz. That's kind of curious. At 49 letter intervals, you also have the name of Ruth. At 49 letter intervals, again, you have the name of Obed. And at 49 letter intervals, you have Yishe, which is, we would say, Jesse. And then at 49 letter intervals, you have the name of David. What's interesting about this is you have Boaz, Ruth, Obed, Jesse, and David. That is the family tree of David. In 49 letter intervals, they're in chronological order centuries before the book of Samuel and the whole the monarchy altogether. This is, in the book, these, this is in the Torah. This is in the five books of Moses. You need to understand... This is in Genesis. After that comes Exodus and all of that. Then comes Leviticus. Then comes Numbers. Then Deuteronomy. Moses dies. Then Joshua. And they conquer the land. After that generation, you have the book of the Judges. And after the book of Judges, you've got Samuel, which finally gets to the house of David. The house of David, the family tree, of course, is the family tree of the king of the universe, Jesus Christ. But how astonishing it is to find this anticipated in the very structure of the text in Genesis 38. You see, the, you see, the truth is in the details. You see, you're getting all these details, it's kind of boring. Now, stand back and realize what's going on here. God's fingerprints are all over this thing. There is no way that Moses could know in advance the genealogy of David. Samuel didn't know about it until the time came. 
He got the youngest brother when he goes out to the selection and so forth. And uh, you'll find this family tree here. We'll also discover it. It's hidden, tucked away, if you will, in the book of Ruth. But uh, kind of fun stuff. Well, then we get to the career of Joseph. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you can just sit there and read it. It's very readable. Joseph, of course, is favored. He's the firstborn of Rachel. Has the coat of many colors, as it's often called. Uh, he dreams of us. He has these strange dreams of, uh, of ascendancy. And the sheaves, the sun, the moon, the stars bow to him and so forth. And he's sold into slavery by his brothers. They were going to kill him, but uh, they got talked out of that. When he gets to Egypt, he's imprisoned by Potiphar because his wife tried to put the make on him and, and he wouldn't do it, so she spread the lies. I think Potiphar knew she was lying or he would have had him killed, but he nevertheless had to do something to save face, so he's imprisoned. While in prison, he interprets dreams of the baker and the wine steward. Again, you got the bread and wine theme there, the butler and the baker. And he, of course... Then when, years later, when Pharaoh has some dreams that he can't interpret, they remember, oh, there's this guy in prison that knows how to do that. And he, of course, interprets the famous dreams of Pharaoh, the seven fat cows, seven lean cows, the seven plump heads of grain, and the seven thin heads of grain, pointing out there's going to be seven good years, then seven famine years. So uh, Joseph, of course, is called to interpret this. And because he interprets it to Pharaoh's pleasure, Pharaoh puts him in charge. He becomes the prime minister of the world. Pharaoh ruled the world in those days. Joseph is the prime minister to administer this during the plump days to get ready for the famine. But when the famine does hit, it brings the brothers there to beg for food. And he doesn't, they don't know who he is. Incredible drama. You can just read it. You don't have to add to it. He keeps Simeon as a hostage to get Benjamin to come. On their second visit, Benjamin is with him. And one of the most touching scenes in the entire literature is when Joseph finally reveals to his brothers that the one that they sold into slavery, they, they thought was dead, is now the prime minister of the world? You've got to be kidding. What a, and, and, and he loves them, and he, he, he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And he recognizes that all this was to pr preserve the family for God's purposes. And Jacob and the rest of the family migrate to Egypt, and that's how they get into Egypt until J Joseph dies. And that sets the stage, of course, for the book of Exodus. Before the book closes in Genesis 49, Jacob, as he's dying, prophesies over each of the twelve tribes. Little enigmatic riddles that you want to study. And I'll just give you one of them to give you an example. He speaks of Judah. He says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, the Messiah comes. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. It's very interesting to know that the scepter refers to the tribal identity and the right to apply and enforce Mosaic laws, namely capital punishment. Shiloh is a term meaning it belongs to the Messiah. It turns out Herod the Great dies, Antipater was murdered, then Herod Archelaus is appointed by Caesar Augustus. He's dethroned and banished. Caponius is appointed procurator in about 6 to 7 AD. There's a transfer of power that Joseph, Josephus talks about. It's interesting that Caponius takes away their ability to administer capital crimes. That's why when Jesus is going to be crucified, they have to go to Pilate to get permission. They don't have the right for capital punishment. It was taken away by Caponius in between 6 and 7 AD. What's interesting is that Jerusalem Talmud records that when that happened, the priests, the high priests and the rest put on sackcloth and ashes and marched around Jerusalem because it said, Woe to us, for the scepters departed from Judah and the Messiah has not yet come. They knew that since the scepter departed, by their definition, that the word of, they felt that the word of God had been broken. They recalled in Genesis 49 that Jacob had predicted that the scepter would not depart from Judah until the Messiah comes. The scepters departed. Woe unto us. The word of God is broken. That's their view. What they didn't know was, while they were doing that, up in Nazareth, there's a young kid in the carpenter shop. And there were some that did recognize that, Simeon and Anna and some others. The Levites also important one to understand. They were exempt from military duty. They were all subordinate to the sons of Aaron, which are the priests. Not all Levites are priests. The sons of Aaron were priests. They were teachers of the law, and they were also the judges, and they guarded the king's person. They're sort of like the Praetorian. They're not military, but yet they were the Praetorian guard for the king's uh, safety in his house. So anyway, uh, that sets the stage for the next time. In the next one-hour session, we're going to try to put in broad perspective the rest of the Torah. We've spent the first four on Genesis because it's basically a foundation. Exodus will deal with the birth of the nation. Leviticus, the law of the nation. Numbers, the wilderness wanderings before they get to the land. 
And in Deuteronomy, which is basically three sermons by Moses, the laws are reviewed and it's wrapped up. So that's, that will be our challenge for hour number five. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Well, Father, we just praise you for who you are. We thank you for this opportunity you provided for us. We recognize that there are no accidents or coincidences in your kingdom, that we're all here right now by your divine appointment. So, Father, we would just claim that commitment of yours, that you would teach us all things. We pray, Father, that you would just reignite in each of us a new hunger, a new passion for your word, that we each might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, that we each might become more fruitful stewards of the opportunities that you placed before us, that we might be more pleasing in your sight. So, Father, we do just commit, not just this evening, but ourselves into your hands. We just ask you, Father, you would make ever more clear what you would have of us in the days that remain as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservation. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.